All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Elliott, and I'm Director of Education and Strategic Initiatives at the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And I hope you are all healthy and happy. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, Telework Cybersecurity Best Practices. And um, so before we dig into it, I want to cover a little bit about who the National Cybersecurity Alliance is and why we're here today. And then um, we'll dig right into the content and introduce the speakers. The National Cybersecurity Alliance is a one of the country's leading neutral nonprofit public private partnerships, um, really devoted to cybersecurity and privacy education and awareness. And we do that through large scale campaigns. Uh, for instance, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is recognized every October, um, Data Privacy Day, which is recognized every January 28th. And Cybersecure My Business, which is a year-round effort to support the small and medium-sized uh, enterprise across the country. And we do that through webinars, through in-person workshops, and through newsletters uh, and uh, web-based information. Now, none of this would be possible without our board member companies and our sponsors. Now, our Cybersecure My Business program specifically is sponsored by our signature sponsor, Trend Micro, um, our affiliate sponsor, Generali Global Assistance, and our strategic partner, ITSP Magazine. And together, they make all of this information, our in-person workshops, our webinars, all of it, free for you to consume. So I want to thank them all for participating um, and supporting us. So on today's webinar, we have two uh, amazing speakers. I've had the privilege of hearing them and seeing them both speak in different scenarios, and they're uh, going to provide us with a great uh, overview of telework and cybersecurity concerns around telework today. So we have Ed Cabrera, who's the Chief Security Cybersecurity Officer at Trend Micro, and we have Greg Young, the Vice President of Cybersecurity at Trend Micro. And so. Gentlemen, before we um, dig into some of the telework best practices themselves, I think it might be good for us to talk about, um, you know, what are some of the the threat landscape that we're you're seeing uh, from Trend Micro's perspective? And I was lucky enough to come across Trend Micro Research's graphic, and I have it right here where it's the map of threats using COVID-19. And so I'm wondering if the two of you can talk a little bit to this slide and lay the, the current threat landscape out for us, because it seems like with all of the telework going on, there's a, there's a, um, a treasure trove that cyber criminals are taking advantage of. And so I'd love for you to take some time and kind of lay it, lay the foundation for us here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when you look at some of the threats that coming out of, uh, unfortunately, what we're dealing with right now with COVID-19 is nothing new. Um, however, what we've seen is this increased volume of activity associated with it. And, and the reason is it's twofold, right? Uh, an opportunity like this, uh, like you said, is a treasure trove uh, opportunity for cyber threat actors around social engineering. So this is the thing that we see all the time around um, geopolitical events, uh, you name it. They're just opportunities for social engineered emails, phishing emails and spam uh, to be generated and sent out. Now spam is, is like casting a net, obviously, when it comes to uh, trying to um, compromise victims and then phishing a little bit more targeted and obviously spear phishing uh, extremely targeted. But all these tactics are, are and individuals and groups are really utilizing COVID-19 to do so from a social engineering perspective. Um, you hear spam email, not really surprising. We, we have BEC associated with COVID-19. We have malicious URLs. You know, a lot of this stuff is in the back end, right? So with the social engineering attack is one to get you, uh, the victim, get your attention, right? It's really understand, okay, you need to look at this and sort of get your guard down, right? They want you to trust the information that's being presented to you. And then they want to take advantage of your interest in this particular topic, right? And so um, this is just an, another great opportunity. So a lot of the stuff that we see 
is not new, it's just ramped up. Um, the other piece I would say, which is unique, is global cyber threat actors love um, diversionary tactics, right? They, they understand it from the physical world that if you're gonna attack somebody, uh, if you draw their attention in a different direction, you're able to then probably be more successful in attacking somebody, even on the physical side, but not, and for uh, quite some time now in the cyber side is, is, is this, because, you know, and you think, well, why is this? Well, you think of all the thousands uh, and possibly millions of teleworkers now that weren't there before. And this creates a huge amount of stress on, on IT infrastructure, information security personnel, uh, the processes and the technology associated with that. And what they do is they utilize that as that opportunity to sort of hit that seam while uh, everybody's tired, uh, while the technology might not be there and where the processes uh, might be bypassed to, to, to deal with this uh, continuity of operation uh, challenge that uh, companies are having. So it's twofold, social engineering, and then this whole notion of uh, diversionary tactics. Um, and, and again, it, it's, it's not going away and it's gonna to continue to be here and they'll only pivot. But uh, I'll throw it to Greg and, and see if there's more we, we wanna talk about on the threat side. Yeah, that um, these numbers are based off of a very large number of sensors in the tens of millions. Um, but what I found interesting was that uh, you know, recognizing our theme today being telework that a lot of teleworkers right now are were deployed pretty quickly and probably not with all the defenses they needed so from a malware perspective they probably weren't given you know good malware defense deployed with them potentially not for all their home devices uh, and malicious urls which you may be protected from in the workplace uh, in your remote office you may not have anything uh checking your urls so those were interesting also recycling um of old malware based around ransomware that some of the COVID specific ransomware kits we're seeing now are actually just repurposed old ransomware. So like Ed said, um, some of the old, some of the new uh, mixed together. That's great. Thank you guys. And you know, this is, has such an impact on individuals and organizations, not only from a psychology standpoint, right, of teleworking, it, uh, just this different model of working, but a, a geography standpoint, a technologies, all the ologies, right? It is impacting businesses in so many different ways. Um, are, how have you seen like some of the biggest impacts to business operations for this massive migration of um, to telework? Because you know some organizations are used to this, right? They telework quite frequently, but to many enterprises, especially many some smaller or medium sized organizations, they didn't do a lot of this, right? So. What are some of the biggest impacts you've seen to organizations with this massive shift? I think, you know, the one thing is, is really like in your face is the fact that, and depending on, like you said, where, what sector you sit in is the lack of technology, right? We assume that we live in this mobile world that everybody has their own uh, laptop and, and so forth, bring your own device uh, era that we live in. But I mean, I think what the challenge is now you have divisions, be it in, in cities and in, in counties and in state uh, government agencies that they didn't have the resources and or the infrastructure to provide that technology, be it mobile or laptops for, for individuals to, to sign in. So I think that is the biggest challenge. And then the, the other piece is the, the, the security to go along with it, right? Not having that security bundled in like you would have on an enterprise laptop or desktop, right? So that, I mean, I, I think it's the technology piece that really jumps out at me. Yeah, I agree. From an enterprise perspective, a lot of companies were shocked pretty quickly with VPN licenses that they didn't have enough and also just internet capacity when suddenly, you know, the internet capacity, which you had internally uh, is gonna be very different from where you're gonna have a lot of teleworkers suddenly uh, utilizing that for internal resources where they wouldn't before, uh, that was a big shock. Um, also, some of the quick buying that had to happen by enterprises in that, for example, the uh, dark fiber rates, um, you know, were in play. So what folks were gonna have to pay for uh, new upgrades to their internet connections um, was a pretty quick quick and stressful move. From the home teleworkers themselves, um, you know, uh, there, there is an issue with that digital divide, uh, you know, where a lot of people just don't have even the resources to work at home. So they were sent home and said, right, use your, use your home PC, 
They're home with their kids, um, you know, five family members trying to share one device. And in many cases, have really poor or non-existent internet connections for some folks, depending where they where they are. So some of the counties that we were aware of, you know, where they where they have very limited internet on the best days when they're deployed from their home, um, you know, they've been struggling in some cases and and concerned about their jobs because of that. I imagine even particularly people who live in rural communities, right, who might not have the best connections that some in the in a metropolitan area would be able to take advantage of. Or old devices even that can't run a lot of business apps, especially, for example, look at the what, uh, you know, uh, video conferencing uses, you know, there is some uh, capability required there and some really, you know, older, older books, um, you know, laptops or Chromebooks and that really struggle with it. So, yeah, it's a real, real challenge. And, and think about it, and, and Greg sort of highlights that and it happens in my house is now if, you know, you do have a den or an office, now you're sharing that that becomes a classroom. And then it becomes also um, my daughter, she's working and now she's working from home and then the office. So, so you end up hot bunking, not only, uh, you know, from a physical space. Now the, the, the challenge is, is now you potentially might have a device that's being shared to sign into classrooms, uh, other businesses. And so you can see that cross infection, uh, opportunity uh to you know pardon the pun here in the, in the world we live in but i mean that's that's it's a big challenge and we you can't be understated and uh, I've, I've spoken with ivy league CISOs who say that the internet or the their universities are what the internet needs to protect themselves from they're such nasty environments sometimes absolutely that makes a lot of sense so let's talk a little bit about the support staff first, right? Um, give them a little love. So some organizations might have one IT support staff, or they might have a managed services provider providing IT or information security support. Um, and some might have a hundred, who knows? So how can we support some of these help desk or the support staff who are providing IT support services? What, what, how can we share the love with them, right? Because I bet they are just overwhelmed with support cases right now. Yeah, that's a great uh, place for bad guys to attack as well with these overwhelmed support staff, especially for password resets, for example. So one of the best, best practices we've identified is, is don't force a, a wholesale password reset with a new teleworking force. Uh, because that will overwhelm your your help desk or other, you know, don't try to roll out some new business apps right now. Don't say, we're hey, we're going to move you over to Office 365 suddenly as part of this. What a great opportunity to try something new. So try to maintain the standards, um, except there's, there may be some risk in some cases, but it's a greater risk if, you've, uh, if, you're, if you're compromising your, your policies around security, such as password reset. That's a great point. The, the, the support staff... Um... <laughs> And it's not only at the enterprise side, it's now I've become the IT support <laughs> in my house. Uh, you know, it was on the personal level. Now it's actually with equipment. So I, I think you're absolutely right. How do, how do you sort of shore up some of that um, sort of not only jobs and, and, and tickets that they're getting uh, that are building up, but uh, what can you do to possibly sort of help yourself to, to to look at some online training videos to, to brush up on understanding and getting ahead of it so as a so as a user and now a new teleworker it is also you know incumbent upon you to do a little bit of work of of getting that information um and then react reach out proactively to if there's pdfs now you know and this is where that it um enterprise it infrastructure and where they can really help if they can is quickly spin out videos tutorials or pdfs um, to help out uh, their users yeah. well, that's great and i think as a last point be patient with them right now <laughs> right <laughs> yes uh, whether it's one person or many <laughs> be kind be Absolutely. kind that's right so we have a few slides that Greg has put together here um, to walk many of you through um, some of the best practices um, as far as helping staff set up a secure office. And so particularly if for many of you who are doing this suddenly, um, these are some great tips. And so um, Greg, I'll let you um, run with it here and um, you can just tell me next when you want me to move forward. Sure. And uh, please, add, uh, you know, we can, uh, I'd like you to join in because uh, we share the experiences here as well. Uh, first one, 
Yeah, first one is, um, you know, give them the security tools. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen with this rush to telework where a lot of, um, you know, especially small and mid-sized organizations have sort of sent their employees home and said, go forth and, uh, oh yeah, and do, do secure things while you're doing that, stay secure. Um, but without providing them with, you know, endpoint security tools or with any guidance on even how to set up a VPN or two-factor authentication or even, um, you know, which, um, you know, video conferencing tools to use. So, you know, of course the bad guys said, hey, let's put up some video conferencing free sites that look, uh, you know, that are actually malware. Even, uh, you know, even tools around, for example, um, you know, anti-theft cables, just because, um, you know, in your home, if, if your corporate laptop is moving around or being used by somebody else, that's, that's a risk as well. I mean, what, what Greg talks about, it's very important too, because now it's a challenge right now from information security teams, how they are risk compliance. So it's not only uptime and operational for users in certain divisions or uh, sections of a certain company or organization to connect, absolutely. But now we're having these organizations that if they're in a very um, regulatory, um, you know, uh, regulatory sector, a regulated sector, excuse me, compliance is a big key. And so now you're also looking at what do they need from a home work perspective? And that cable, that lock is that one thing that, that comes up uh, and any telework situation is you need to have that, right? So you might house might be secure and have alarm and so forth, but that's one of those things that to have it in there. Especially in the banking sector, we've seen them. We have some great best practices there. So um, that needs to be extended elsewhere. Uh, Non-corporate devices, most home environments, you know, my home, uh, I'm sure about all of your homes, um, you know, multiple devices. Um, and why do we put teleworkers in there without protecting all of that sort of, you know, subnet? So, you know, on the LAN at your work, everybody's gonna have that, you know, endpoint protection, but why don't we do that uh, in the home? So quite often, a lot of the licenses that you have for security products, um, in fact, are per user, but they can be extended to protect all the devices in the home. Uh, and if you don't have that, why not protect them? It's uh, quite often right now in this environment, um, you know, licensing, uh, if requested, can be very permissive. Um, you know, why would you have on the same subnet, you know, uh, sort of infected and non-infected, non-infected and protected devices. So, um, and it goes, goes with that as well, the home routers. We knew before that this was a great target for teleworking. Um, if I'm gonna have to choose between an enterprise class router to, to pop or, you know, my, uh, my home router, um, which is a lot less money, uh, I'm going after the home router. So um, you can help, you can help uh, secure those as well. I think it's a good point there because I think twofold. On one hand, we're seeing home routers and routers being provided by ISPs that do have uh, security um, baked in. And, and we do the same uh, with some of our products and tools, but also don't assume that that security is turned on by default, or just don't assume that that's secure, there is security within that router uh, to begin with, right? So yeah, there has to be some level of, of proactive. And back to what Greg was saying is, um, let this be an opportunity. If you're not already doing so, definitely expand those security solutions across all of your devices uh, within your house. And we're gonna talk about this in the upcoming sections, but uh, you know, secure up gateways. So protecting your employees when they're, you know, uh, when they're browsing the net, whether from URLs or malware, that's, um, that's very important. Um, but give also this idea of enterprise storage. Uh, it's really fun right now with, with the Zoom limits on how long a, a, a web conference can be, which some people think is a feature. Um, but the, you know, the uh, providing enterprise class tools like Dropbox, uh, you know, or video conferencing tools or whatever it's going to be, um, those steer employees away from trying to find their own and hitting the ones that are, that are possibly malware ridden um, or storing sensitive documents in places they shouldn't. Um, and then, for example, if you're sharing Dropbox with your family, um, you know, mixing corp documents in there, not a great idea. Um, give them the tools so they don't have to search and do it and give them a standard. It's easier to share Dropbox files amongst, you know, Dropbox, for example, or whichever resource you're going to use. So if you give them tools, they will use them rather than go and search for them and maybe hit some malware along the way. Well, we, we did have one question that came in that I thought maybe we might address right here. And I will say that we'll address um, a lot of the question and answer at the, at the end of the presentation. But I'm wondering, since we're talking about home routers, what are some best practices for securing some of those home routers uh, if you don't have a more sophisticated one? 
guiding your employees around sort of you can have sort of a there, there are some great lists out there already of sort of you know good ones bad ones or or ones that are you know fairly reliable and ones that are notoriously uh problematic um, but also even just how to update them or what the basic settings are as ed mentioned yeah i think there is a lot of in the newer routers there's a lot more um capabilities around security and configuration However, depending on the router, it can be more complicated or it could be a, a simple setup. You just have to be really focused and do your homework uh, to see exactly, not only are you gonna pick the right router, but what do I need to, to secure it? I mean, I think, uh, and then back to the, uh, just jump back real quick about the storage. I mean, um, Greg sort of hinted at it. I mean, you do have Dropbox for family and you have Dropbox potentially for your business and or for your uh, at the enterprise level, just make sure you're signed into the right one. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge there is um, inadvertently saving uh, sensitive documents to a personal um, uh, storage, a cloud storage uh, solution. And back to the routers, uh, I mean, one of the questions was about is just assuming that those home routers are not secure, and that's a really good point. But I think as part of our normal scripts for uh, help desks, it's not a question we normally have been asked uh, I've never been asked it in, in, in teleworking and other companies I've been at. And um, just assume, you know, make that part of the script to ask, you know, which router are you using? And, you know, to have the ability to, to look at the, the ones that are notoriously uh, unpatched or have, have vulnerabilities that have never been patched and see if it's on that list. And could that be a, a hint for resolving that issue? Yeah, and I would start at, at, at your employer, right? Start there and looking at possibly there's that list of pre-approved routers and pre-approved solutions and possibly that might be already available for even for personal use that comes to, from, a, from a licensing perspective but also from the routing perspective so and then actually then do your homework and absolutely 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 always assume that it's not uh, secure how about that awesome artwork <laughs> <laughs> Did you draw that yourself? <laughs> yes, in fact, that was part of my very high tech uh, home teleworking uh, whiteboarding uh, software. <laughs> nice. Thank you, COVID 19, to really bring out that creativity, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have trouble drawing with gloves on. So, <laughs> so tell us what this means. What is, what is this? Yeah, so what, what it means is that there are two basic scenarios for when you're outside and you're VPN in. Um, actually, on our, uh, I've got a, uh, a podcast I share with a colleague named Bill Malik and uh, called Real Cybersecurity. And we had uh, a guest on who was, you know, uh, uh, helping us drill into this topic. And specifically, what it is is split tunneling. So basically, if you're going to be browsing the net as a teleworker using a VPN, either your traffic is going to go back to corporate and then hairpinned out, we call it. Uh, so sanitized back there, but that's a, uh, you know, that's that, um, uh, th that's a scenario where all your internet then has to go back to your office. So it can be quite, you know, heavy latency. Um, it's more secure because your, your company gets to scrub it. Um, but there's some issues there. So latency, uh, internet, um, you know, connections at the, at the corporate side. Um, and also, so there's some privacy concerns and things like that. Split tunneling is normally in place where you say, okay, if I'm doing corporate stuff, I'm connecting to corporate apps, that'll be encrypted, but my, my browsing won't be. But then that browsing is unprotected. The bad guys say, hey, you know, great place to put malware or bad URLs out there to catch you. Uh, even URLs that look like your company uh, URLs for some of your corporate apps. Um, so what's the alternative to protect that? Well, one is giving access to your employees to a secure web gateway as a service. So whereas my company has a secure web gateway, as you can see, you know, in those cases that just before I hit the internet from the office, that'll scrub everything. But instead, why don't I have some place that'll scrub it for me and protect me, protect my URLs um, as I'm browsing from home. So it's easy to deploy as well. Um, there's some very noteworthy ones out there that are that are cloud services. But the really cool part is because it's as a service or in the cloud, you don't have to deploy any equipment. And it's um, it's mostly a pretty easy experience for remote uh, remote workers. Great, that's a great tip. Add anything to add on this slide? No, no. I, I think when you look at um, these gateway and gateway protection, and Greg alluded to it. I mean, it's it's checking that 
sort of uh, which sites are legitimate, which sites are not. There's protection from from you know from your surfing perspective, and and true, there's a lot of capabilities that you can get when you're doing it this way, right? So so the thing is, is that that it's truly beneficial when you do it this way. Yeah, just before this call, I I got a link on my uh, on my phone. Uh, advising me where I could pick up my uh, COVID-19 check, um, you know, with a obviously suspicious link and, you know, if I'm busy or if I'm excited about getting that money uh, and get tired and, and click on it, um, you know, what's protecting me from that? So that that should be part of that service. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, how timely is this video conferencing? Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, like any good IT person, we have to create new acronyms. So there's uh, bring your own video conferencing or BYOVC. Yeah, I like so that. I've never seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, throw that into a sentence with split tunneling and uh, impress the family around the dinner table. <laughs> so, you know, one of, the, one of the things we saw early on was the ability, you know, there's been a lot of talk of, you know, Zoom bombing or, you know, security around video conferencing. Um, a bigger issue, of course, is privacy issues and how to, how to, how to set those and you know there's there's some pretty pretty clearly understood articles now on how to do more secure video conferencing but the bigger concern is um you know managing recordings for example so with the enterprise versions of with zoom and webex like we're on today um you know you can do recordings of these calls um where you store those and the like versus a free one or if somebody else owns it uh, is a very different issue than if it's an enterprise owned one so, um, you know, if I'm using, um, you know, some of the new wraps, some of the very common ones that are being used right now for just social purposes, um, you know, if those are recorded and where they're stored and how they're stored and how they're secured is not always clear, um, or does that third party have access to those recordings uh, or the live stream itself? And um, for the enterprise versions as well, um, single sign-on is so easy. So you have the same enterprise single sign-on that you use for your other apps and you use for your video conferencing. It just makes a lot of the management, especially for internal meetings, so much easier. Everybody's authenticated, uh, same level as your normal authentication, and um, you know it's an easy signing. You know who all the parties are on the line theoretically. No, absolutely. When you look at, um, <laughs> I think there's enough challenges with having family and pets bombing your, uh, <laughs> your <laughs> video conferencing. Um, which makes for great <laughs> memes and shares. But no, I, I think you, when you look at this, it, it, it is, you know, the other things that, and all the recommendations that we're getting now, making sure that, you know, you, you have waiting rooms uh, set up and be able to manage and, and look at uh, who is really signing in and, and sort of validating and vetting those uh, individuals signing in. Um, and Greg said the privacy piece, uh, absolutely. Where you're storing that, where you where you where that recording is, because it's not only in real time where it becomes vulnerable, and then it goes where 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 is that actually being stored, and is it protected? Is it somewhere that has uh, security solutions around it? Right? So I think I think those are really important. I think that goes back to one of the points you made earlier, which is you know equip your staff who are teleworking with these resources that they can use that have been pre-vetted already by your security team or individual, whoever it is, who is helping you uh, with your cybersecurity, because what you don't want them to do is go out and find their own solutions, right? <laughs> um, understand and equip them, empower them with the resources that you have vetted ahead of time. Yeah, and even internally, um, you know, we're a, a heavy telework at, you know, a tele teleworker environment with our, you know, 7,000 employees and even even then, we distributed internally a guide about security settings for our web conferencing system uh, as a quick sort of guide just to refresh people or, or for the new teleworkers uh, to not make them try to have to, uh, you know, act be ashamed if they can't figure it out quickly. Great. I think we have another slide here. Um, again, with a, when you allow people to find their own devices or, or to, you know, uh, choose which video conferencing you're going to use for your internal meetings, especially for any sensitive stuff, um, you know, uh, extra sets of credentials, uh, you, you never want to be sharing credentials across. So, again, if I'm using my corporate uh, single sign on, um, what I normally put into there, but if I'm using it on third party sites, hey, what a great way to capture identity. Even if I'm going to, as a bad guy, I would say, hey, do you know what, I'm going to pay for a lot of bandwidth. I'm going to offer some really cool uh, video conferencing. But I'm going to capture all those missed missed logins, or I'm just going to take the logins and authenticate based on those. 
Yeah, you can't say enough about the <laughs> the shared credentials, and that's not the right thing to do, uh, and it creates incredible problems, right? Um, so can't say that enough. That's great. We've covered this before. Um, again, um, you know, uh, try to try to make the apps available. Don't force people to uh, you know use unfamiliar things or or to choose uh, choose what they're going to do. Um, and maybe amp up the help desk support for some of the apps which people just really aren't used to using remotely, especially even the VPN uh, tools. Um, you know, not assuming that people know how to use those. The worst case is loosening policies right now on password resets. So when staff are you know are going to be really busy with those, you've got to maintain the standard. Unfortunately. Because if uh, the bad guys are counting on trying to social engineer their way through help desks right now to uh, to get credentials. And Greg, you provided a link up here. Is that all those tips? Are they in that link or at that link? Yeah, that's the um, actually the uh, that's one link there, I believe, to uh, one of the reports. And um, uh, we can provide the link afterwards to the uh, that data. Uh, that we shared in the, in the slides. There's actually a number of uh, uh, a bunch of other links that we provided other other data sources and um, uh, data views on some of the other things we found in the last few weeks. So I um, I have a few more questions for you guys. I want to take advantage of uh, having you both uh, on the line together. And I think one of the questions I have is you know operationally, right? What could organizations do to kind of guide their employees or enforce uh, secure behaviors, right? How can we kind of structure this teleworking environment where employees are um, practicing secure behaviors? Right? You know what, I, I think from a, from a training and awareness perspective, I think there's already been this evolution of uh, training and aware, awareness, um, apps, services, and so forth. I think this would be a great time to sort of pivot on that. And um, there's actually some companies offering gamification of information security awareness. Um, you know, I think we're pretty much um, beat into the head with public service announcements associated with COVID-19. And so possibly the only concern there is that we might be desensitized. So I think if you come up with some creative ways to actually get that information out to your users, i.e. via an app um, and or when you're possibly going to do a, uh, a Zoom and incorporate or any other um, uh, connection or, or uh, video conferencing capability, do some polling, get some uh, that interaction going. So I, I think just this is the time to get creative because I think we're, we're pretty much desensitized to all the information that we're getting. And I mean, the information security piece is, is going to be up there. So get creative. Yeah, with like first, you know, today's turnout, I think is testament that there's a real appetite right now for for information, especially in a in a new kind of learning environment. So what a great time to do some security education or have a security Q and A via uh, you know via WebEx or Zoom internally to your company. Let people ask questions, answer them. Um, you know, take questions in this sort of you know semi anonymous ways. You're not naming and shaming, um, especially you know when people are more stressed right now and um, you know are are. Uh, you know, uh, not as thick skinned as they would normally be definitely. So yeah, it's a great education opportunity and also to put people at ease about this new environment they're in. That's great. So one last question before we go to Q and A, and that's regarding the IT infrastructure, right? What stress does all of this teleworking put on your information technology infrastructure and how can companies uh, mediate that? um as much as possible at this time as they have more employees teleworking what can they do to kind of um, make sure that they don't crash their systems no, I, I think you know I, I said in the beginning that that is a huge vulnerability right now is uh, individuals the people are stressed there's not enough individuals not enough possible resources and then the actually and then the technology technology limitation so that's it becomes great opportunities for threat actors and I, and I think, you know, um, I would say that every data breach, every ransomware attack, where there is a techno uh, technology vulnerability associated, be it a software and operating system possibly, but I think more so it really goes down to people and process. And I think if, from 
from the perspective of the company and an information security team, I think this is where you start looking, okay, how do I uh, shore up that process piece? Um, and like we talked about, is this uh, increasing the lines of communication, increasing the information, to be able to have users really engage. And I think the engagement is, is critical, but I think that process vulnerability or that seam is critical uh, because I think, you know, we, we really forget as we're trying to do everything we need to do from the user trying to complete their job or do their function, right? And then obviously the IT professionals and information security teams trying to do their job and make it secure. So huge challenge. I think, you know, even some tactical items like uh, privacy policies and, uh, you know, if a SOC is, you know, reaching out, uh, you know, if somebody's using their own device at home, you know, having uh, an updated privacy policy, not only to be able to do that potentially to look for, you know, IOCs on a home home device, but also respect the employee's privacy as you do that. If there's other files on there, the like, um, you know, providing assurance and following through on that assurance that you're going to treat those files uh, confidentially. And not uh, use them in in some you know sort of human resources aspect. I think this is also the, the I think it's also the new reality of how we're we're going to have to manage IT now. So um, you know I think that there's some some great learning, but also loosen up the purse strings a bit. So if an employee doesn't have great internet at home and that's becoming an issue, you know just provide it. If if their machine does blue screen or you have issues with it, um, send them a new one and and deal later on with getting the old one back. Absolutely. I think um, there's, depending on the organization, there's some playbooks or resources or plans that are already like part and parcel being activated when something like this happens, right? So you're at your continuity of operations I mentioned earlier. Um, these plans oftentimes probably are not going to address everything that you're facing right now, right? But there's um, already uh, steps in place that you might just have to modify, right? To, to, to be able to, like Greg says, increasing, you know, that time to delivery of any kind of uh, resources that they might have and sort of bypass some process uh, around, um, say, procurement or, or, or uh, just being flexible, I think, when it, when it comes to it, because I think that that's the, the, the biggest thing is, is time, but also being secure at the same time. Great. So now we're going to open it up to some Q&A. And so while um, I'm going to move into letting you know about a few resources while you're submitting some questions. Um, one, uh, Trend Micro released a blog, Suddenly Teleworking Securely. I encourage you to check that out. And we will post uh, the recording of this webinar with slides so you can take advantage of um, that. And we'll push out that link as well to you all. The National Cybersecurity Alliance uh, also noticed that a lot of resources were coming out on teleworking, um, also on avoiding cyber threats and scams. And so what we did was we created the COVID-19 Security Resource Library a few weeks ago so that um, as we see new resources coming out, uh, we're putting them together in this resource library in alphabetical order uh, so that you're able to access some of these resources. So you can implement them and use them as resources in your training and awareness or whatever uh, you're planning to do. Uh, we have a lot of great stuff there. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, and if you just go to staysafeonline.org, you can find uh, the security library right at the top of the page. I also wanna let you know really quickly while we're collecting uh, questions that this one webinar is part of a series of webinars that we collaborated with um, Trend Micro um, and Generali Global Assistance specifically on as our program sponsors to provide information or resources to the small, medium-sized uh, enterprises across the country. And so as you'll see, we have a lot of different, uh, we have some that are repeating, uh, but we have some um, others on such as e-commerce and mobile payment security as more businesses move from a lot of foot traffic into e-commerce and uh, mobile payments. Uh, we have a lot of scams coming out uh, specifically targeting um, small, medium-sized businesses and consumers. And so we'll have the Federal Trade Commission. And again, we'll have uh, some Trend Micro experts talking about what are some of those scams. You can register for any, all those webinars at staysafeonline.org, the link at the bottom in our general events section. And so um, 
now we will go to Q and A, and we've received a few. Um, one question that we just received is, shouldn't we also stress the importance of keeping the devices at home that are being used to log into a company from being used for, by unauthorized people? So physical device security, how are we limiting who, what authorized users are using which devices? Any advice on that? No, I, I think the advice is yes, absolutely. It's a recommendation you should do. I think the challenge is, is like we were mentioning earlier is that depending on that that family, that remote worker, they might not have multiple um, computers that they can actually leverage. So sometimes, especially now when you're dealing with um, kids and, and, and going to school remotely, right? So that's a big challenge, but absolutely, I think, privilege, right, <laughs> at work, but now at home. So uh, if you can do it, set aside uh, that one computer dedicated to what you're going to be doing at work. And definitely don't let children download anything. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're getting them to do your work for you, which is really cool. <laughs> which might help. You never know. <laughs> that could be good. Yeah, I'm convincing so we have another. Teenage, I'm convincing my teenage son that um, all the homework that he's been assigned is actually uh, some kind of corporate writing assignment from his English teacher. So. <laughs> we had a question. Speaking of authorization and access, we had a. We had a question of, do you recommend two-factor authentication or passphrase usage versus uh, password vault generators? So I guess the question is, you know, one, do you, and should they be enabling two-factor authentication on everything? And do you encourage password vaults or uh, uh, passphrase generators? You wanna go first or? Um, you, you go ahead, Ed, because I've got strong personal <laughs> opinions that are, that are highly right. understood. So, <laughs> so, so the, short, the short answer for me is uh, yes, right? You, you should be even prior to COVID, past, after COVID, you should be doing two-factor authorization, uh, authorization on any uh, device or service you're signing into, personal or professionally. So, yes. Um, not all created equal, and then we get into the more of a discussion and opinions on whether the pass vault, keychain, any password managers, and how that should be utilized, if it should be utilized. I, I think it then gets down to a, a level of, of preference. Now, there's a level of risk associated with all of it, right? Um, I think we've, we've proven and we have research saying that um, SMS verifications, two-factor authentications, the codes that they send you to your mobile devices can be hijacked, can be um, uh, taken over. So, but it, do you not do it because you know there's some vulnerability and not utilize it? If you don't have any other, um, you know, capability, then you use it. I, I just think you need to use it from a personal risk management. Now you're utilizing it from an enterprise risk management. It's you got to make those decisions that I think are the are best to enable you to do the job, but to do it securely. So I think it's one of those things that's not a, a simple yes or no. But I think ultimately the one thing I would say is that definitely you should have two-factor authentication, multi-factor whenever possible. I think there's gonna have to be some flexibility right now, especially given realities that if you assume that it's business as usual, that's where you're gonna run into trouble. So, for example, if your employees are at home and they have kids who are going to be using the machine because it's the only one in the house, um, give them the ability or some guidance on how to do that. So maybe it's going to be uh, changing things so that um, saying that, no, that's not allowed or yes, we're going to allow that and we're going to give you a separate uh, identity on workstation, the guest account that you can use to separate them from the corporate resources and to make sure they're not uh, you know, logging in uh, and, and using any stored stored passwords or identities. Um, I think that kind of flexibility and, and pragmatism um, is there. Um, I've even seen some companies right now who are sending home a second Chromebook to say to enable their families. Uh, uh, this is the case that that was a financial sector client who was doing that, recognizing to try to protect the um, you know the corporate devices uh, from uh, you know from from other home users. And if, and if your password scheme right now is something that people have to write down, this is the worst time to have something like that. So simplifying your your identity and access management, it's a great time to do that right now. We had another question um, going back to uh, this is a hot topic uh, 
for this audience in particular. So if an employee is using a personal home device to work on, would you recommend they set up a separate login account just for work, even if they already have a separate login for each family member? If they're using the personal devices for work, how should they segment access and users? Create your own profile. Yeah, absolutely. Depending on whether it's a Windows uh, um, computer or or Mac or Linux, there is different uh, ways of doing it. But if you're able to provide or create a different profile separate um, than others, uh, than other family members, yes, I think that's uh, definitely recommended. Especially when there's uh, commonly used apps right now, like Slack, or that is, you know, a su supplanted email in many environments, uh, that can be a single click, um, you know, login in a browser. So, um, you know, great, great time to do that, especially when, you know, home environments are, are getting, getting stressed right now. So we have, would you recommend asking or requiring employees to encrypt their personal laptops if used for work? So is there any company liability if something goes wrong? good question yeah i know i think that with the things being different right now this is an unusual thing so um if um you know financial sector and some other environments where there is a lot of you know uh, uh privacy related information um you know or sensitive company information being involved that you know that's going to be the trade-off to saying hey you know if you're going to be allowed to work at home uh which you know uh right now i think it, again, the the employee employer sort of relationship has changed i'm not saying it's unbalanced i'm just saying it's different um, you know, that might be a recognition, um, but from the company's perspective, I'm saying if you're going to expect that, um, yeah, you'd better, uh, you better have at least, you know, provide them with a backup tool. Number one, a backup account. There's lots of great ones out there or give them the volume to be able to do that. Don't let them try to just use a free service and, and, and maybe just catch some documents. Uh, but yeah, give them a corporate environment to do that or send them the device to do it. If, if it's, if you're not comfortable with the risk that you're taking there. I think it's from a, you know, a concept perspective, I think, yeah, I mean, I think wherever possible, you're able to do that. Uh, it increases the security, but it's the implementation, right? It, it's, that's the challenge, right? Going forward, like we mentioned all earlier from a technology piece. I mean, there could be very limited technology inside that household. So you gotta be prepared to be able to provide, uh, like Greg said, uh, you know, backup and or other solution. We had a question about VPNs a little while back, virtual private networks. Um, are VPNs necessary if teleworkers are accessing secure websites from a secure Wi-Fi at home? I think absolutely. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry to jump in, but I think absolutely VPN, because if you think about it, it, it is you're creating a tunnel within a tunnel. And so the <laughs> more tunnels, uh, the better, so to speak, where you're now, not only you're, you might be utilizing a secure connection through your browser, right? To your banking uh, applications or, or other secure um, connections. However, what the VPN does, it provides the opportunity to protect um, your access to your computer more locally, not direct access to it, but I mean, um, um, using not that anybody's going to any um, Starbucks lately, um, uh, or or for that matter, or at least sitting down, um, you know, looking at public Wi-Fi uh, spots. I mean, so so VPN, you know, I always say it is definitely recommended. However, we've seen that VPNs can be uh, vulnerable, and or any software for that matter or operating system it, it has vulnerabilities. So the point is is being able to to sort of layer your own personal risk management as much as possible. And I think VPN does that. Yeah, no, definitely for uh, like apartment dwellers, people sharing their neighbor's Wi-Fi and things like that in these environments, even more reason to do that. Um, Absolutely. Especially if you have technically competent uh, neighbors. <laughs> and uh, another so question, was somebody gonna add something? Yeah, sorry. It was just that also sometimes changing apps might be required as well. That instead of having the full, you know, app being used, um, you know, or full browser, doing a remote presentation, uh, we've certainly seen some companies move to that, where they're going to be, you know, having a virtual, uh, virtual desktop presented rather than a full desktop. Uh, certainly, again, in financial, military, 
Um, you know, some public safety organizations do that. So then, um, you know, you're not uh, you're not as vulnerable, um, you know, to local malware. So we had um, one question that goes back to education and awareness, right? And I, th I think Ed, you mentioned uh, the importance of training your employees. Um, and one person asked, when does awareness at this time in particular become too much? Um, I, saw, oh, I saw that question. <laughs> um, yeah, and it speaks to exactly what I was saying that, you know, you can inundate your users with too much training and awareness and all that does is have people tune out, right? Um, and then unfortunately operate in some risky manner uh, to uh, during their day-to-day -day operations. So I, I think, again, can't be shelved. It has to be understood that there is a lot of, um, you know, information security awareness being, um, you know, provided to them via the internet, via every, you know, uh, TV shows, business shows, you name it. Um, but the point is, is that maybe here is a great time to sort of look at that plan that somebody brought up, uh, again, utilizing gamification or using uh, utilizing an app. Or like Greg said, I love that idea, is actually doing a Zoom, you know, maybe not with your entire organization, depending how, how big it is, but if it's, if it's small enough, you do everybody on there, and then you just do an interactive engagement like what we're doing right here, is literally having a coffee talk around uh, securing, you know, home systems and their connections to work. And if you're considering doing any sort of uh, phishing testing um, uh, right now, um, you know, one of the great expressions we had in the military was uh, don't be a jerk. Um, you know, be really careful about how you're phrasing, um, you know, those tests. If you feel obligated to do them right now and some organizations are mandated to do them, that's fine. But just, you know, especially around COVID themes, be very careful about the, the context you're using. Uh, you know, employees could have a sick relative. People are very stressed right now, you know, mental health. Uh, is a is a real concern amongst your staff, so don't don't aggravate them. So be very careful about the context and the theme you're using for any any phishing testing uh, or education that you're doing. That's great. So we had another question. Uh, I switched over. Some people have sent me questions in my private chat that I'm just now seeing. So um, we have one. Uh, do you have any thoughts and recommendations on how to protect work devices on home networks when they're not connected to the VPN? Uh, it is actually Trend Micro is providing um, our internet security solution uh, for teleworkers to be able to do such protection, right, for their families and themselves for their devices uh, during this time frame. And so I, I think. Um, it is looking at what are the options? Uh, is it something that's already being provided for free from your company or organization, like extended licenses? Um, looking at like what uh, Greg mentioned is not just uh, an anti-malware, anti-virus uh, solution of protection, but now you're looking at gateway uh, protection, your network traffic, your um, uh, as far as from an email and, and web surfing, so to speak. So anywhere where you can possibly shore that up, uh, there are solutions out there, obviously. Um, uh, and there's a lot of opportunities to get those either from your employers directly for free and or from, you know, such as ours. We had a question, is there some kind of playbook on securing home networks? And I, I will add to that one um, in particular that we do have a lot of resources on that COVID-19 resource library that a lot of partners, including Trend Micro, have come together um, to write up um, playbooks and infographics uh, and blog posts on securing home networks and uh, telework. So I would look there um, to begin your begin your research. Yeah, there isn't an official playbook though. <laughs> yeah, read about there's a different configuration, uh, security configuration that you might be looking at. And so you really have to, uh, it's not, it's not the, the one-stop shop um, because some of these devices have a lot of similarities, but some are different. So um, absolutely, I would start there and then pivot from there. So we got a question about uh, what if we have um, users at home that are using 
uh, Max for work. Um, and this was probably more of a, a, a very small business kind of a question, but do they need security software? You know, there's that misconception often that Macs don't need security software, right? Um, do they need it? What are some of the security concerns? Are they similar uh, for Macs as they are for uh, Windows machines? Well, I, uh, anybody knows me that I love my Macs and, and, and it created the sort of uh, following within the family. And so um, Macs are pervasive in our household. But I, I, I would say this, you, you never assume any uh, computer technology operating system or software is secure in and of itself, right? You always have to have some layer of security or, around it. I think the challenges with the Mac, it, you know, from a small business is applications, right? When you're now, you're dealing with an, uh, uh, a Mac and possibly that small business and or company you're working in and it's all Windows based. So there's ways to, from a Mac perspective, there's a way to boot camp and, and install Windows on a part of your hard drive and, and, and within Mac uh, forums and other solutions, you can get real fine, easy ways to, to do that. There's virtual machines, uh, virtual boxes, a free and open source uh, software that you can create Windows uh, operating system. So it's almost like a computer within a computer. But then if you have to utilize that, and actually sometimes, and, and I think arguably safer to do that, but in any event, you can utilize that as possibly you know, from a from a challenge around the apps perspective. So um, I think that communication with your IT team and telling them what you have and what you don't have, more importantly, and what's the best way forward. Yes, yeah, spear phishing is platform independent. So, you know, a uh, link in an email, it's going to it, it's going to uh, have bad outcomes uh, probably in the environment. So, cyber criminals don't care which one you're using, do they? <laughs> Want to get in there? <laughs> no, and and I think Mac has has enjoyed um, a you know the Mac ecosystem has enjoyed this uh, uh, sense that from a market share perspective that for the most part people or threat actors are focusing on Windows systems, but no longer the case, right? Uh, I think proverbially, I think they're realizing the market shares and the individuals that may or may not be utilizing it uh, become better targets. And so, uh, yeah, definitely never assume. Especially if you, uh... well, I wanna thank the two of you uh, for spending the hour with us and sharing your expertise. And I wanna thank all the participants for logging in today and spending the hour with us. We know you're busy and um, it's wonderful that we had so many of you join us today and stay with us throughout the entire hour. Uh, and thank you for your questions. Um, Ed and Greg, any final words of advice? I, I think you're quite simply, you're not alone. And um, you reach out, um, reach out to your your employers first, or if you're the employer and you're that team securing those new teleworkers, reach out not only to those of us in the industry, obviously selling security solutions, but obviously resources resources such as the National Cybersecurity Awareness Alliance and so forth, focusing on those opportunities where you're able to like sort of tap in into some SMEs, that you're not alone, reach out for sure. Yeah, to follow on with that, just ask questions. There's no shame in that. Uh, there is a lot of shame, though, in not asking the questions and having to go hat in hand and say you've been hacked. So, yeah, no, ask the questions because it is a new environment right now. So everybody is in that same boat. Thank you guys so much. And uh, as I said, the, the this presentation was recorded and we'll be sure that we get it posted and shared with all of you. And we'll be doing another session of this coming up on Tuesday, June 9th with Ed and Greg again. And we'll try to change it up a little bit, try to ask a few different questions. Um, and so I wanna thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful, healthy uh, rest of the, rest of the spring. Let's start there, <laughs> all right? <laughs> yeah. Thanks Ed, thanks Greg for joining us. Take Cheers, care. thanks. Hey guys.